Greetings, my friends. It's been a while since we've talked live like this. Got the president behind me, always praying for him. And, uh, and Washington behind me, too. That's very profound. Never noticed I got two presidents in here. Well, two presidents, Moses and Jesus, and the prophet Daniel. Well, I'm surrounded by a hall of, uh, of historic people in my office. But I got something for you I wanted to share with you, and this is really important. It's a verse that I just discovered, again, in La Biblia. Look what it says here. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Kind of cool, interesting, that in all ages that there's been a concern that God's people be deceived with persuasive We're living in an age of such ubiquitous media propaganda bombardment that the whole idea of deceive you. But what was it he said? He said, in, in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he was guarding them from something. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. See, we could be cheated. We could be deceived by persuasive words that are actually philosophies that are empty, empty philosophies. And not only there, but Paul also warns somewhere over here, he says, hey, also be careful. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, worshiping angels. This is interesting. Intruding into things they have not seen, but are vainly puffed up by fleshly imaginations. I think we got a lot of, a lot of people that are mystics in the body that, that are, are so willing to talk like they're experiencing and engaging in some really supernatural I was in visions or the Lord, uh, dreams and, you know, and heavenly visitations and God did this and God did that. I think we're all hungry for it because we all believe in it. But a lot of it's empty. I mean, it's empty. It, it kind of addicts you to the person because you want to hear what they're saying. But that's not healthy. What you want to do is you want to be going back to Christ. Like, so Paul says, you know, that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are already complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. And that's interesting. All the devils you'll ever be up against, Christ already has defeated them. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. In what? In the cross. He wiped out all the handwriting of requirements, all that was against us, which is contrary to us, everything contrary to you. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The cross is the great act that cancels out Satan's power. The cross does that. Now, when did he disarm principalities and powers? When did he make a public spectacle? Nobody in Jerusalem saw it. It was in the ascension. So when Jesus on the third day, remember he says to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to, uh, I have not yet ascended, but I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended. The third day, Jesus comes out of the grave. Remember, he went, went to hell, plunders hell, comes up to the grave on the third day. He hasn't gone to heaven yet. He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And when he put his, hand, his spirit into God's hands, he went down into of the place. Now, hell is a place called their Sheol, and uh, that's that's part of the compartment of hell where the righteous dead were. Remember, there was like Abraham's bosom. They, they had not yet gained access to heaven. They were in a place that is the, the place of the dead or the departed. When Jesus descended, the Bible says he descended before he ascended, he went down and proclaimed that he had accomplished what the Father had called him to do, that he had finished the work that Father gave him. Then he came back up, picks up his body, and while he's picking up his body, Mary runs into him. He, witness, he manifests himself to the disciples, lets them know that he's alive. And then he ascends, and when he's ascending, this is when he goes up through the ranks of second heaven. Remember, there's three heavens, earth, second heaven, Satan's domain, and then third heaven, God's domain. As Jesus ascends, 
he goes through the ranks of second heaven and disarms the principalities and powers and makes a public spectacle of them as he ascends into that place. The ascension is probably one of the great mysteries that is never preached in the Bible. But in the first century church, it was a real big deal because he that ascended will descend the same way that you saw him go up. Remember that? But uh, it's, it's, it's spoken of in Hebrews. Let me see if I can find it. If I can find, I'm doing it with my left hand here. The one-handed uh, Bible preacher. But uh, when Jesus does the, does, goes up, he literally pierces through the dimensions of second heaven, Satan's domain, and he goes up into the Father's presence. And when he does so, he makes a public spectacle. We do not know how he did this. But all the company of that was with him saw it, and all of heaven beheld it as he went up. Now, here's what I'm saying. Let's check it out now. I'm not crazy. This is what the Bible teaches, that uh, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him in whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. There it is, plural. See, I'm not teaching crazy stuff. Heavens, plural. He went through the first heaven, which is the earth realm, and then second heaven. Jesus, the, the high priest, passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest which cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He sympathizes. Don't run from God when you're feeling weak and backslid. Run to him. He was in all points tempted. He was mocked. He was irritated. He was misrepresented, but he didn't sin. Let us therefore come boldly, not sheepishly, not embarrassed, bold to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. That's what we need. You know, you know what mercy is? When you deserve judgment and get mercy. Mercy is when you could be punished, but God decides to give you a break. So you come at a time of need to get the mercy, to find the grace. That's the, that's the divine enablement. Grace there means supernatural power to help you in a time of need. Does that make sense? I hope it does because Jesus, when he, when he went up, and he, remember that, he went up through the heavens. He went up, passed through. That's the ascension when he stripped principalities and powers of their power. I think this is kind of, this is wild. So now God wants you to get those images in your mind because when he arose, you arose. You were with him. That's the genius of his death. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for you and me. So when he died, you died. When he arose, you arose. And when he ascended, you ascended, which is why the Bible says right back there in that uh, verse we were starting with that you are supposed to be. So I'm sticking over here. Don't, don't follow all the ministries with the mystical experiences and go sitting for their latest YouTube post on what they saw in the spirit realm. You got your own walk with God. Get your own walk. Get your own spirit experience. Because if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting. You're invited to go where Christ is sitting. You're invited to go. Let me see this again. If you were raised, yeah, maybe you and I were in him when we did this. You were in him when he was raised. Seek the things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right. You're supposed to go right up to the throne of grace. There it is. There's your throne of grace invitation. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you are dead. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Then when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. You'll have a glorified body and your real identity will be revealed. It's powerful. So, Chris, you know, and I think about this when I was watching Joyce Myers the other day, and it, this just happens. Great preachers, great teachers take a single verse, a single idea, and because of the limitation of the audience, they just go one verse deep and they, and they fillet it from all these angles with stories and anecdotes. But I mean, I just went through like around 15 verses because the entire New Testament is for you, not just a, a single verse or a single idea. And I think we're weak because we're not feasting on this word. We're not actually eating what God gave us. Take a look at this. 
Same book, Colossians. Above all things, put on love. You put it on. You don't feel it. You just put it on. It's like I put on this sweater today, which is the bond of perfection. And let, notice this, you put on love and you let peace rule in your heart. You let it. You say, where's the peace, Lord? Well, peace is in you. You got to let it come up. You put on love. It doesn't overtake you. You got to put it on. When you don't feel like it, you got to put it on. But you let that peace of God rule in your hearts like an umpire. And uh, to also which you were called in one body. And, and what's the secret? Being thankful. Getting an attitude that is focusing on God and not on your circumstance. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word dwell richly. What are we doing now? We're going to the word. I'm not giving you the news cycle. I'm not giving you the latest Biden statistics or what's happening with Iran and Russia and China. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teach, admonish one another. Oh, and that says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms and hymns. I should go over to my piano over there and do a spiritual song. Evidently, singing was a big deal in the first century church. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, even if you're doing something for someone else, look at this. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men. So that when you're working for somebody, you don't work. You may have a creepy boss, a selfish boss, a company doesn't care. People that don't, do it as unto the Lord. Suddenly God comes into the job. Instead of uh, being, you know, separated from God, you, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm sweeping the floor for the Lord. I'm cleaning the kitchen for the Lord. I'm preparing this meal for the Lord. And, and, you're, and you're doing it as unto him. And the Bible says, and the Lord will repay you. I'm working for Jesus. I'm not working for a man. When the time comes, I got to move on. God will move me on. Why? Because I'm not working for the man anyway. I'm working for the Lord. Does that make sense? You have ascended. You have you have, the problem is we don't feel, we're so feely, we're in the feel world, and, and so your feelings have nothing to do with it, your feelings are deceptive, your feelings could be lying feelings, see, uh, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places, you've got angels around you, and you're born again, and, and you're separated from this world, I'll prove it to you, you could not feel like dying and be dead, and your spirit comes out of your body, and right away the angels are there to escort you. There's real devils, you got real angels, and you find yourself um, in the presence of God. And when Christ returns, all those who sleep in him or who are dead in him are going to be uh, alive together with him. Meet the Lord in the air and come back down to earth. He that ascended is coming back down. First thing the angel said, to the disciples. Why are you looking up into the sky? This same Jesus that you saw going up is coming in like manner. He that ascended, first descended, went into hell, came up with all of captivity with him, visited his body, picked it up, talked to Mary, touched some disciples, and then went up, spoiled principalities and powers right through second heaven, made a display of his triumph over them, went to third heaven, and when he went there, what do you think he did? He went before the Father as your representative. But here's the amazing thing. The Bible says he went as your high priest. Remember that word I just gave you? Why high priest? Because he was presenting the sacrifice. He wasn't going up just as the conquering king. He was going up as the high priest. And what does the high priest do? He presents the blood. He's presenting the offering. And what blood is Jesus going to present? Well, that's the amazing thing. He's presenting his own blood. That's the, that's the powerful truth. The promise is that he would go before the Father and he would present his own blood. That's the wild thing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm reading it over here. So, the, uh, so in Hebrews it says that he went, he went before. Now look, look, check this out. Remember, I told you he went up into the heavens, plural. But into the second part of the, the high priest went alone once a year into that, into that holy place. He went into the second part, but not without blood. This refers to even first heaven and second heaven. The second part of the tabernacle was parallel down here, but it represents the levels of earth 
and the spirit realm. And he went into the second part. The high priest went alone once a year, but not without blood, which he offered on the day of atonement. He offered that blood. Now watch this. And he offered it for himself and for the people's sins. The Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all wasn't yet manifest. The way into third heaven wasn't yet manifest. The way to the throne of God was not yet manifest while that first tabernacle was standing. It was symbolic for the present time till the Messiah would come and he would have the power to cleanse our conscience with a perfect sacrifice. Now watch this. This is so wild. But Christ came as a high priest, ascended through the heavens. He came with a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that he took his own body and went into the heavenly places. And look what he brought with him, not with the blood of goats and calves like the Old Testament, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. Woo! He ascended with his own blood. He brought his own blood with him. I don't know how he did it, but he brought his own blood up into third heaven. I got news for you. The blood of Jesus is up in, in heaven right now. The blood of Jesus... How much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit that offered himself cleanse your conscience from dead works? This is wild, people. Jesus ascended to heaven with his blood. Now you know, when the Bible says that he comes back uh, 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 riding upon a white horse with a vestment dipped in blood, the literal uh, Greek says, with the belt dipped in blood. A champion, when he comes in the ring, like, you know, Mike Tyson or a boxer, they hold up the title belt. They hold up the belt. Well, that belt is the champion's belt. Jesus has the champion belt wrapped around him, dipped in blood. His blood is as alive, as wet, as rich, as red now as it was 2,000 years ago. It's It didn't go into the earth and just evaporate. It was retrieved because he went to third heaven with his own blood. And when he comes back, he comes back with the vestment dipped in blood. And that blood is at the throne of grace. That's why you can go to the throne of grace and ask for mercy because the blood is crying out the throne saying, come. The blood has a voice. The blood has a voice. The blood has a voice. And the blood is calling you to the throne of grace. In Jesus' name. You know, I get my accounts suppressed sometimes. It's so sad. I see the numbers go down. Share this broadcast. Share this broadcast. Lest you become taken captive by philosophies and vain deceits and all kinds of other conversations and miss the fact that you have already been made perfect in Christ. You're in him, invited to uh, seek him at the throne of grace where the blood of Christ has already gone. Satan can't stop you because Jesus bound them and that blood has made a place. That blood has made a place right through hell's ranks and it doesn't matter what you feel, doesn't matter what you sense, your prayers and your faith connect with the throne of God the moment you release them and only you can cancel it by your unbelief. Hallelujah. Does that make sense to you? I thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus is breaking heaviness off of people. I know down here it's getting a little darker, a little more mischievous, but it's okay because the light is getting brighter and the anointing is getting stronger and the blood is coming down with greater power upon us. Why? Because the Bible says that we have this witness in the book of Revelation by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood literally speaks and the blood speaks through you by the Holy Spirit of prophecy. The blood has a voice. The blood cries out greater things. The blood has a voice. It's crying out mercy over your life. It's crying out grace over your life. And grace is divine enabling. It's crying out greater power into your life. Break the uh, philosophies. Break the vain deceit. Break the arguments. Break the strife of earthly things off of you. It's just low-level devils manifesting on the earth through flesh, preying upon the fears and anxieties of people about the future. The future is in the blood of Jesus. The future is unalterable. The future, 90% of prophecy in the Bible is about the end times. If we're in the end times, trust me, you're in the most prepared for period of history that God ever had. 
All of it's been prepared down to the detail. All you got to do is walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit and do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's something you got to choose not to do. I'll tell you how it happens. You get a heavenly vision. You get a vision that you're seated with Christ in heavenly places and that the blood is inviting you and that God's talking to you and you ask God to fill you with the spirit. You get full of the word and thanksgiving and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs keeps you overflowing. Then you'll start to feel the anointing that you're moving on by faith. Then you'll start to flow in the anointing that you're operating by faith. Then you'll start to experience the gifts of the Spirit and cooperate with the gifts of the Spirit at a greater level. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Does that make sense to you? Share this, will you? We need to, we need to alert the body of Christ that the blood of Jesus is now calling us to the throne of grace to find mercy. And don't run from God, run to him, run to him. And let's. Uh, and we're getting sprinkled with the blood again this year in a fresh way. And the word of God, we're gonna feast on that word of God and the word of God is gonna be like a, like a metabolized in us. There's been a famine of God's words in the last year. You notice that? Ever since the uh, election uh, assault on America and the spiritual disruption and, and everything, is, it's like the supply lines spiritually seem to be almost interrupted for so many saints. I mean, we're, we're living okay, but the, 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 the flow of the, the word of God for this moment has been kind of a struggle. But I say, hallelujah, don't worry about it because the Lord has an answer. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You guys ever seen me do this before? <laughs> I don't think I've ever done it with you. Glory to God. Hope, hope my camera doesn't fall on the floor. Right now, we're going to practice what the Bible says. We're dwelling on the Word. We're dwelling in the Word. And Jesus went up into heaven. He went up into the most holy place and shed His blood. He shed His blood in the holiest of holies. And that blood is there right now calling out your name. It's calling out your name. I believe the Lord is calling us now up into his presence. Take me past the outer court into the holy place past the brazen altar Lord I want to see your face take me by the crowds of people and the priests that sing your name I hunger and thirst for righteousness but it's only found one place. Take me in to the Holy of Holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the Holy of Holies. Take a coal, bear my lips, here I am. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, for each one that's listening to this, the powerful refreshing that comes by the presence of your Rachadesh, your Holy Spirit bearing witness to the blood. Oh, the blood that cleanses, the blood that frees. I thank you, Lord, for the mercy you show to me. I thank you for the blood, the life that's in the Lamb, the life that's coming now to your people in the land. This Christmas, invite the angel of the Lord into your house. Invite the angel of the Lord into your house. I'm telling you, God wants to visit. I got a word from Kim Clement. And it didn't happen that year. He said, the angel of the Lord should come to you this Christmas. I remember we were waiting. But he was always a mysterious prophet. I never knew which Christmas it was. I pray that for you right now, this Christmas will be a time when the angel of the Lord will visit you. But it will happen because we set apart our hearts like this, to seek his face. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. 
into the mercy lift them up into the strength of the blood there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and every sinner plunge beneath the flood will lose stains he will lose his guilty stains he will lose his guilty stain and every sinner plunge beneath the flood will lose his guilty stains You know, the great Charles Spurgeon, greatest preacher in England, when he died, he could have put anything on his tombstone. Thousands went to his funeral. The Queen of England went. And when they unveiled his cement monument, these were the words from this hymn that he had written on it. Then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing your power to save When my poor lisping stammering tongue Lies silent in the grave When I'm silent in my grave When I'm silent in my grave there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And the blood is alive, my friends. The blood is alive. The blood is alive. The blood is alive. The blood is alive in Jesus' name. To bring forgiveness, to bring healing, to bring life, to bring hope to bring resurrection. Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world is risen. Alleluia, he's risen. Alleluia, he's risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you, Lord, for my friends tonight. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Don't let anybody take your mind captive by philosophies, news cycles, or vain deceit. God has written this period of your life in his book. Draw yourself near to the throne of grace and enter in where the blood dwells. Because the blood has a voice. And the blood is about to prophesy. The blood is about to speak, my friends. The blood is about to raise up a prophetic voice in America. And oh, how all hell is going to shake. And life is going to come into the dead bones of the body. For there's an awakening pent up in the heavens that's about to break out for the saving of America and you're the voice he's going to use God bless you Merry Christmas if you like this video make sure you like it here and also subscribe so that you can get other broadcasts in the future as soon as they come out and you know what would help me Make a comment and give me your thoughts on what you'd like to hear about in the future.